step into the enigmatic world of Natalie Wood, a story shrouded in mystery and shadow. On a fateful night, November 29, 1981, aboard the Splendor Yacht, the renowned actress met her untimely demise, plunging into the depths of the Pacific. The circumstances surrounding her death remain a haunting enigma. So grab your favorite glass of champagne. Make sure your doors are secure and cozy up. For we're about to delve deep into the shadows of the past to uncover secrets long buried. Step into the Noir Syndicate with me to unravel this twisted tale that we call Natalie Wood Whispers in the Waves. This is Inky Noir Champagne Mystery. Imagine a tale of intrigue and mystery, where the past of a young girl unfolds like the pages of a suspenseful novel. Born Natalie Zakarinko in the fog-shrouded streets of San Francisco on July 20th, 1938, to Maria Zudilova and Nicholas Zakarinko, Natalie's life would begin as an enigma waiting to be unraveled. In the quiet town of Santa Rosa, a tale began to unfold, a tale woven with the threads of grace and mystery. Maria Zudilova, a woman of elegance, carried with her the echoes of past loves, including a union with an Armenian mechanic named Alexander Tatulov. Meanwhile, Nicholas Zakarenko, a carpenter from Usheraisk, bore the weight of a family history, scarred by the turmoil of civil strife, seeking solace in a new land far from the shadows of Vladivostok. From the distant lands of Russia and China, Natalie's lineage traced a path of refuge from the storms of war a path that would lead to her birth and the beginning of an extraordinary journey. In a twist of fate, her parents' paths converged, setting the stage for Natalie's transformation from a quiet girl in Santa Rosa to the luminous star known as Natalie Wood. Renamed by the whims of Hollywood, Natalie's journey mirrored the twists of destiny. From a chance encounter on Santa Rosa streets to the glittering allure of the silver screen, her story, a testament to resilience and the allure of fate, resonates with the echoes of a life destined for greatness. In the hushed anticipation of her fifth birthday, Natalie Wood took her inaugural steps into the world of cinema, a fleeting 15-second glimpse into Happy Land, 1943, catching the discerning eye of director Irving Pitchell. Patiently bidding his time, Pitchell kept a watchful eye on Wood's budding talent orchestrating a serendipitous reunion with her family in Los Angeles two years later. With unwavering determination, Wood's mother heeded Pitchell's call, whisking the family away to Tinseltown, 
despite her husband's reservations. At the tender age of seven, Wood's star ascended in Tomorrow is Forever, 1946, where she portrayed a post-World War II German orphan alongside luminaries like Orson Welles and Claudette Colbert. In a controversial bid to evoke emotion, Wood's mother resorted to tearing apart a butterfly before her daughter's eyes, a tactic that sparked both criticism and acclaim. Undeterred by controversy, Wood's talent continued to shine, gracing the silver screen in The Bride War Boots and The Ghost and Mrs. Meyer, 1947. Each role showcasing her burgeoning abilities, but it was her role in Miracle on 34th Street, 1947, that solidified her status as Hollywood's darling, captivating audiences with her portrayal of a girl discovering the magic of Christmas. As her career blossomed, Wood remained committed to her education balancing her on-set duties with academic excellence. Despite the pressures of fame, her mother remained a steadfast guide, navigating the pitfalls of stardom with grace and determination. Throughout her formative years, Wood's talent and dedication garnered acclaim, earning her the title of most exciting juvenile Motion Picture Star of the Year by Parents Magazine at just nine years old. And so, amidst the glitz and glamour of Hollywood's golden age, Natalie Wood emerged as a star destined for greatness. In Natalie Wood's journey from child prodigy to teenage luminary, she illuminated screens both big and small with a string of captivating performances. The early 1950s saw her grace television sets as Anne Morrison in The Pride of the Family, followed by memorable appearances on the Pepsi-Cola Playhouse and General Electric Theater. Her portrayal in the GE Theater episode Carnival garnered acclaim, establishing her as a blossoming talent in Hollywood. Venturing into feature films, Wood's roles in The Silver Chalice and One Desire of 1955 laid the groundwork for her breakout performance in Rebel Without a Cause in 1955. Cast alongside James Dean, and Sal Mineo, Wood's portrayal of the complex character Judy earned her critical acclaim and an Academy Award nomination. Despite parental hesitations, Wood's gravitation towards the role signaled a newfound autonomy in her career choices. Post-Rebel, Wood's continued to captivate audiences with film roles like The Searchers, 1956, and A Cry in the Night, 1956, showcasing her versatility on both the silver screen and television in shows like Studio One in Hollywood and Warner Brothers Presents. Her cinematic journey took a romantic turn opposite Tab Hunter in films like The Burning Hills of 1956 and The Girl He Left Behind, also 1956. Though the anticipated box office chemistry failed to materialize. In 1958, Woods tackled the lead role in Marjorie Morningstar, portraying a young Jewish woman in New York City grappling with familial and personal identities. Transitioning into adult roles, Wood's characters evolved, 
blending her signature childlike sweetness with a newfound complexity reflective of the era. From Judy and Rebel Without a Cause to Maria and West Side Story, 1961, her performances resonated with audiences, establishing her as a Hollywood powerhouse. Films like Splendor in the Grass, 1961, and Love with the Proper Stranger, 1963, showcased her range, earning her critical acclaim and multiple Academy Award nominations. Director Sidney Pollack lauded Wood's prowess, noting her unmatched talent when perfectly suited for a role. Despite facing criticism, Wood's grace and sportsmanship shone through, cementing her status as one of Hollywood's brightest stars, alongside Elizabeth Taylor and Audrey Hepburn. After the lukewarm reception of Penelope, 1966, Natalie Wood decided to take a three-year hiatus from acting focusing on her mental well-being. During this time, she underwent therapy, severed ties with Warner Brothers, and revamped her professional team. In 1969, she married Richard Gregson and made a triumphant return to the silver screen with Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice in 1969 a comedy exploring themes of sexual liberation. The film garnered both critical acclaim and commercial success, marking a significant turning point in Wood's career. Following the birth of her first child in 1970, Wood scaled back her acting commitments, opting for sporadic appearances in projects such as The Candidate, 1972, The Affair, 1973, and Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, 1976. Her performances in The Last Married Couple in America, 1980, was particularly lauded for its sincerity and depth reminiscent of her earlier acclaimed work. In the late 1970s, Woods found success on the small screen, earning accolades for her roles in The Cracker Factory and From Here to Eternity, 1979, the latter of which earned her a Golden Globe Award. She also appeared in the disaster film Meteor, 1979, and reprised her role in The Last Married Couple in America, 1980, before her tragic demise in 1981. Throughout her illustrious career, spanning 56 films for cinema and television, Natalie Wood left an indelible mark on audiences, often heralded as our sexual conscious on the silver screen. Despite occasional criticism, she remained a beloved and respected actress, sought after for her undeniable talent and captivating presence. Wood's marital journey was as dramatic as any Hollywood script. Her first union with actor Robert Wagner captivated the public eye, commencing on December 28th 1957 in Scottsdale, Arizona, when Wood was mere 19 years old. However, the curtain fell on their marriage on June 20th, 1961. As the couple announced their separation through a joint press release, culminating in a divorce 10 months later on April 27th, 1962. Following this cinematic marriage, Wood's romantic escapades became the stuff of legend. 
she found herself entangled with the likes of Warren Beatty, Michael Caine, and David Niven Jr. With a brief engagement to a Venezuelan shoe manufacturer, Ladislav Blotnik, in 1965, adding to the narrative. On May 30th, 1969, Wood exchanged vows with British producer Richard Gregson after a courtship that spanned nearly three years. Their union bore fruit in the form of a daughter, Natasha, born on September 29, 1970. However, the marital bliss was short-lived as Wood filed for divorce from Gregson on August 4, 1971, with the legal proceedings concluding on April 12, 1972. After a fleeting romance with future California Governor Jerry Brown, Wood rekindled her romance with Wagner in the dawn of 1972. Their love story reached a crescendo on July 16th when they remarried aboard the Rambling Rose, anchored off Paradise Cove in Malibu. Their daughter Courtney was born on March 9, 1974, adding a new chapter to their tumultuous yet enduring relationship. In 2013, Former FBI agent Donald G. Wilson unveiled a clandestine affair with Wood, spanning from 1973 to 1977, a period that coincided with her pregnancy with Courtney Wagner. Wilson's revelations were further explored in a 2016 documentary for the cable network Reels shedding new light on the enigmatic actress's personal life. On a fateful November 29, in 1981, the enigmatic Natalie Wood met a tragic end, shrouded in mystery and speculation, much like the photos of my suspenseful films. While aboard her husband Robert Wagner's yacht, Splendor, off the coast of Santa Catalina Island, Wood's life came to a sudden and inexplicable halt. Despite being in the company of Wagner, Christopher Walken, and the yacht's captain, Dennis Davern, the circumstances leading to Wood's drowning remain a puzzle. Discovered one mile away from the boat, with bruises and abrasions on her body, Wood's demise raised more questions than answers. Wagner's account, stating she was not with him when he retired for the night, added a layer of intrigue. Davern's earlier claims of an argument between Wood and Wagner further clouded the incident. Autopsy findings revealed alcohol in Wood's system, along with traces of medication that could have heightened its effects. Coroner Thomas Noguchi concluded her death as an accidental drowning and hypothermia, suggesting she may have slipped while attempting to reboard a dinghy. However, doubts lingered with Lana Wood questioning her sister's ability to swim and her alleged fear of water. As the sun set on Natalie Wood's life, the circumstances surrounding her death remained a murky enigma, a real life mystery that echoes the suspense of cinematic tales. Let us embark on a journey through the intricate timeline of events that led to the untimely demise of Natalie Wood, a narrative that unfolds like a suspenseful film noir. Journey with me 
into the post-Thanksgiving period of 1981, where Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner found themselves planning one of their customary boat excursions to Catalina Island. Despite extending invitations to numerous friends, their plans were met with reluctance due to the unfavorable selling conditions anticipated that weekend. However, amidst the hesitance, a singular figure emerged, Christopher Walken, Wood's co-star from the film Brainstorm, who happened to be in town for the film. He accepted the invitation, becoming the sole guest to accompany Wood, Wagner, and Dennis Davern, the captain of their yacht named Splendor. November 28, 1981. As the evening unfolded, Wood, Wagner, Walken, and Davern indulged in a champagne-filled dinner at a renowned restaurant, Doug's Harbor Reef, in Catalina. However, concerns arose regarding their inebriation, prompting Don Whiting, the restaurant's night manager, to seek assistance from Kurt Craig of the Harbor Patrol. Whiting's apprehension stem from the fear that the group, particularly Wood, might encounter difficulties navigating back to their yacht safely in the dinghy. Nonetheless, the group departed the restaurant at 10.30 p.m. In a twist of events, Wagner later recounted a heated exchange with Walken after dinner a conversation that took place while Wood was believed to be elsewhere on the yacht. At approximately 11.05 p.m., the alarm was raised as the other passengers realized Wood was missing. Their search intensified as they discovered the absence of the boat's dinghy, adding a layer of mystery to the unfolding tragedy. The toxicology report released after Wood's death revealed that the actress had a blood alcohol content of 0.14% at the time of her passing. November 29, 1981. In the hours of the morning at 1.30 a.m. A ship to shore call was placed, followed by a delayed call to the Coast Guard at 3.30 a.m. This timeline marked by a four hour delay in seeking assistance has become a focal point for investigators and observers alike. In the dead of the night, Around 1.30 a.m. on November 29, 1981, a distress call pierced the air. This is the splendor, needs help. The voice belonged to a 51-year-old actor, Robert Wagner, who along with Dennis Davern, the captain of the splendor, signaled that something was amiss. Natalie Wood, Wagner's wife and beloved actress, had vanished from their 60-foot yacht. As the hours passed, the sun rose to reveal a grim discovery. Approximately six hours later, Wood's lifeless body was found floating face down in the Pacific. She was dressed in a simple flannel nightgown, a red down jacket, and blue wool socks. Nearby, on the rocks near Blue Cavern Point on Catalina Island, Prince Valiant, the yacht's 13-foot inflatable dinghy, lay abandoned. 
its ignition key was off, the gear shift in neutral, and the oars secured in a locked position. The mystery surrounding Wood's death deepened, casting a shadow over the serene waters. November 30th, 1981. The discovery of Wood's body around 8 a.m., approximately a mile south of the couple's yacht, near the secluded Blue Cavern Point, added a somber twist to the unfolding events. On November 30th, 1981, Dr. Joseph Choi, a deputy medical examiner, at the Los Angeles Medical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy on wood. The examination revealed elevated blood alcohol levels and several bruises on her arms, legs, and face consistent with a fall overboard while attempting to board the dinghy. As a result, the office classified her death as an accident as reported by Huffington Post. I'm afraid of water that is dark, she told a journalist just weeks before her death. On a chilly November 29, 1981, at the sheriff's station in Isthmus Harbor, Davern, the boat captain, weaved a tangled web of deception. Initially, he insisted that all four of them spent the night on the boat. However, the police, armed with contrary information, pressed Davern about his falsehood. Caught in his lie, Davern hesitated, expressing a desire to speak with RJ and possibly an attorney before proceeding. In a subsequent interview, on December 10th, with Wagner's attorneys present, Davern came clean, admitting that he had spent the night with Wood, serving as her unofficial bodyguard when she went ashore. Davern clarified that he stayed in Wood's room on that fateful night. We just drank the wine and went to sleep, he explained. We thought it was best for me to stay with her for protection. She knew I wasn't going to make any kind of play for her. She was comfortable with me. The police report corroborated Davern's revised account, indicating that Socorro Miza an employee at the Pavilion Lodge confirmed that Davern's room had the appearance of being unused. Meanwhile, Walken and Wagner remained aboard the Splendor. The following morning, Wood, as recounted by Linda Winkler, a day clerk at Pavilion Lodge, appeared outwardly composed but somewhat disoriented. During their conversation, Wood inquired about boat transportation to the mainland and was directed accordingly. Winkler expressed surprise at the notion of a movie star like Wood opting for public transportation. Later, Wood had a change of heart. Despite her initial plans, she decided against leaving, possibly influenced by a desire not to abandon Walken, who was still on the yacht. Consequently, she and Davin returned to the Splendor. Walken, awakened by Wood the next morning, recalled her mentioning taking a seaplane back and inquiring about his plans to stay. He responded with a decisive, I'm not in this. With resolve, 
would set about preparing a hearty breakfast of huevos rancheros for everyone, signaling a return to normalcy. Everyone acted like nothing happened, Davern remembered, and everything was beautiful again. At around 11 a.m., RJ steered the boat to the Ithmus Cove at the far end of the island. Out on the water, Walken recounted to police. Robert Wagner was trying to talk him into doing some fishing and setting up some fishing poles. He recalled RJ thanking him for smoothing everything over. After their arrival in Ithmus Cove that afternoon, Darren remembered, Wood sat in a main salon and read while he, Wagner, and Walken retired to their staterooms for naps. Upon awakening, Walken and Wood ventured ashore in Valiant, settled into Doug's Harbor Reef, and commenced drinking. Wagner and Davern later that afternoon joined them after taking the water taxi to shore. Davern now reflects that upon their arrival, Walken and Wood were out of it, giggling and laughing. Me and RJ were pretty sober. We don't drink around the clock. Michelle Molesky, a waitress at the restaurant, recalled to the police on November 29, 1981, that Wagner and Davern had arrived before Walken and Wood. When Wagner made reservations for an early dinner, Wood expressed dissatisfaction with the wine list, remarking, we could go shopping on the Splendor and get our own wine. Davin recounted that he and Walken returned to the Splendor for that purpose. Aboard Valiant, Davin recounted he and Walken smoked a joint and when they returned to the restaurant with wine, he felt right in tune with Christopher and Natalie, high as a kite. The group's waitress, Tina Quinn, informed police in a November 29, 1981 interview that during this dinner party, the Wagner foursome consumed the two bottles of wine and one of the men had been drinking daiquiris. She recalled, other parties in the bar had bought two bottles of champagne for the Wagner party. The victim did not eat much of her dinner and was doing a lot of complaining about small things, such as there was too much light on the table. The table was too big. The fish was not fresh. As they were starting to leave, she recalled Robert Wagner lifting a large dark colored jacket, which she felt was being used as a shield because the victim appeared to be stumbling slightly. Then she recalled all of the Wagner party leaving together, and it was her opinion that they were not in the best of moods. She clarified this statement, saying that throughout the evening, the victim appeared to be changing in moods, sometimes laughing and sometimes solemn. Don Whiting, the restaurant manager, also remembered on November 29, 1981, that he thought at the time there was some possible problems between Robert Wagner and his wife, the victim. He remembered some glass was broken, possibly thrown. He was under the impression that Robert Wagner was a little bit irritated with his wife. Walken later explained the broken glass incident to the police, saying it was my fault. I was making a toast while drinking. At the conclusion of this toast, 
I threw my glass to the floor as I always do. I remember Natalie and I think everyone else did the same. Whatever the reason, it wasn't the first time Wood had broken a wine glass when angered or upset. According to Lana Wood, Natalie had crushed a crystal glass in her hand the day that Wagner had left the house after the demise of their first marriage. She recreated the gesture in a television drama, The Affair, in a scene in which Wagner's character abandons her. Davin recalls that throughout the dinner, Wood was definitely flirting with Walken. They were like all giggling and touching. She was excited by Christopher. Here's this good looking guy. Wood didn't want to return to the boat after dinner, Davern said. Both William Peterson, the shore boat operator, and Kurt Craig, the in harbor patrol office, recounted to the police that they watched the Wagner party board Valiant and motor back to their yacht. Craig later reported to the police that as the four were descending the ramp into the dinghy, what he described as a scream came from the female. He thought she may have been drunk and was unhappy at something that happened at the restaurant. At his press conference, Thomas Noguchi stated that according to the information he obtained from police investigators, a non-violent argument had occurred aboard the yacht just before Wood's disappearance. This revelation sparked media interest. To counter the rumors, Robert Wagner provided his version of the final hours. In the 1986 book, Heart to Heart with Robert Wagner, he stated, we reached the boat in a happy frame of mind after spending a few hours at the restaurant eating and drinking. During dinner, I got into a political debate with walking and we continued it aboard the yacht. There was no fight, no anger, just a lot of words thrown around like you hear in most political discussions, such as, you don't know what you're talking about. Natalie sat there not saying much of anything and looked bored. She left us after about half hour and we sat there talking for almost another hour. Then I went to kiss her goodnight and found her missing. Wagner speculated about how Wood ended up in the water. It was only after I was told that she was dressed in a sleeping gown, heavy socks, and a parka that it dawned on me what really occurred. Natalie obviously had trouble sleeping with that dinghy slamming up against the boat. It happened many, many times before and I had always gone out and pulled the ropes tighter to keep the dinghy flush against the yacht. She probably skidded on one of the steps after untying the ropes. The steps are slick as ice because of the algae and seaweed that always cling to them. After slipping on the steps, she hit her head against the boat. I only hope she was unconscious when she hit the water. Wagner's two interviews with the police were less detailed. In the first, at 9.54 on the morning of the tragedy, he simply stated that they were in the salon where the victim would went below to her bedroom shortly after they noticed she and the Valiant were missing. Since Wagner was in an emotional state the interview was terminated almost immediately. In the somewhat more detailed December 4th interview, Wagner related only that after they were aboard a while, Natalie went down to the bed, and at this point in time, he recalled Chris Walken stepping out on the deck for a while. When Chris returned inside the salon, they continued talking. 
he estimated approximately 15 minutes passed. When he went to check on Natalie, he noticed she was gone. When the police pressed Wagner as to the discussion they had prior to her going to bed, he told them it was about her being away from home and the kids so much. He missed her being around. When questioned about the broken glass, which police investigators had found in the main salon of Splendor in the search of the boat that began at 12.45 p.m. the day of the tragedy, Wagner explained that it was probably from the rough seas. Davern, in his December 10th police interview, was a bit more forthcoming, but not much. He recalled that RJ and Natalie got into a discussion about her being gone and how RJ missed her. During the discussion, Chris Walken entered into it, supporting Natalie's views. He felt RJ was getting upset over this and Chris Walken getting up and going outside around this time. Natalie went to the master stateroom to go to bed. Chris Walken came back into the main salon and he was going to bed. Here, this was normal procedure for Natalie. In the evening, she would just leave, prepare herself for bed, and usually return after 10 or 15 minutes to say goodnight. After some time passed, he stated, RJ went to see where Natalie was. When they noticed she was gone, about the same time they noticed the Valiant was gone. Today, However, Davern tells a different and darker story. Back on board, he says he offered to make tea for everyone. While the tea is brewing, the wine is flowing. We opened another bottle, probably Wood's favorite, Pouillet Fousse. Then Natalie lit her beeswax candles. RJ was drinking scotch by then and I joined him. So we're sitting there, and Chris and Natalie were giggling and carrying on, the same as before, totally forgetting that me and RJ are there. I'm saying to myself, oh my God, this is getting to be too much right now. All of a sudden, Davern says, RJ grabbed a bottle of wine and smashes it right on the table in front of them. Glass goes flying everywhere. Jesus Christ! RJ says to Christopher, what are you trying to do, frook my wife? Christopher got up in two or three seconds and headed right out the door. Now Natalie says, I'm not standing this for a minute longer. She goes down to her stateroom and slams the door. Christopher goes right down into his stateroom. Now I'm left alone with RJ. I say, RJ, let's just calm down. We stayed up there a little while longer. Then RJ says, I'm going to go down there and see Natalie. Davin says that he remained on the bridge, located right over the Wagner stateroom. He could hear the couple fighting like crazy. I never in a million years seen them fight like that before. I just couldn't believe it. You know, stuff getting thrown around. It was. According to Daver, a ferocious argument fueled by drink, so hot and heavy that it got carried out into the cockpit at the rear of the yacht. Davern says he next heard the dinghy being untied. You can hear the ropes, the bowline being tugged on. And then Davern says there was silence. It seemed like a long time to him before Wagner tussled and sweating profusely as if he had been in a terrible fight, an ordeal of some kind, came back to the bridge where the two men emptied another bottle of wine. Davern says that it was about 11.30 when Wagner returned. We were up there drinking until 1.30 in the morning. Then RJ said, I'd better go back down and check on Natalie. After a few minutes, 
Wagner appeared and told the captain, She's gone. She's gone? Where the hell is she? I don't know. Davern decided to go look for her. I thought maybe she went into my stateroom, feeling she could confide in me. So I went up and she's not there. So I looked in the empty stateroom. Nothing. I looked in Christopher's stateroom. He's in the top bunk and he's asleep. I looked in his bathroom and thank God she's not in Christopher's room. I knew that wouldn't happen. Davern walked back onto the deck to look for her and that's when he noticed that the Valiant was gone. Davern was baffled. He believes that if Wood had decided to return to shore at night, he would certainly have been asked to go with her. If the stars aren't out, it's total darkness. There's no place to go. Darkness all around. I wouldn't go out on the Valiant at night. Davern says he then told Wagner that he was going to turn on Splendor's floodlights in order to look for her. But Wagner told him not to. Dennis, don't turn that on. Davern then offered to fire up the yacht's engines and cruise around looking for wood. According to Davern, Wagner refused. Don't do that. Let's think about this, Davern says Wagner told him. With the police report, we at last have Christopher Walken's description of the crucial hours preceding the tragedy. It is a story closer to Davern's than to Wagner's. In the first of his two interviews, at 10 on the morning of the tragedy, he told police after they were aboard the boat, he and Robert Wagner got into a small beef. He left the cabin and went outside on the deck for a few minutes. When he returned, victim Wood was sitting there and she seemed to be disturbed. He recalled she then went to her room and he had thought she went to bed. He next remembered the Captain Dennis make a remark, the dinghy is gone. Walken's more detailed December 3rd interview produced this version. They were in the salon talking and they had one of those conversations going where he used as a reference, you put all of your cards on the table. RJ was making statements and complaining that she was away from home too much. She was away from the kids and it was hurting their home life. Mr. Walken stated he also got involved with discussion supporting the victim's views. She was an actress. She was an important person. This was her life. He suddenly realized he was violating his own view about getting involved in an argument between a man and his wife. He stepped outside for some air, and when he returned, everybody was apologizing, particularly Robert Wagner, and everything seemed fine. Dwayne Rissure, a towering figure at six feet three, now retired from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Homicide Bureau, resides with his wife, Joy, in the secluded town of Eager, Arizona. A cowboy in dress and demeanor, Rasseur retained a belt buckle proudly displaying the number 187, California's penal code for murder, a reminder of his past investigative prowess. Prior to his retirement, he had spent 11 years as a homicide detective, contributing to the resolution of the Hillside Strangler case in the late 1970s. Recalling the moment he was called to investigate Natalie Woods drowning, Rasseur recounts, they called me at about 8.30 in the morning. They told me I got the case of Natalie Wood drowning in Catalina, which surprised me. The news threw my wife into shock, and from then on it was a matter of getting dressed, heading for the heliport, where I was transported to Catalina to do my investigation. Upon his arrival, a helicopter delivered Ragnar and Walken to the sheriff's office on the island, where Rasseur introduced himself to Wagner. I could see he's at a loss. 
He's just in trouble. He's hurting. It took just a short time to get a general idea of what had happened. It seemed accidental from the first, probably because of the way I got the information, the way it was presented. Someone fell overboard and drowned. Nothing in the world would make us think at the time that there might have been something suspicious. Despite the pressures of the investigation, Rasura remained focused. However, he started receiving calls from old friends deeply affected by Wood's death. They would call me up, Rasura recalled, and say, Dwayne, tell me what happened. I love that girl. I watched her grow up. A week after the drowning, Rasur visited Wagner's Beverly Hills home to question him a second time. Despite Wagner's attorney's reluctance, Rasur was determined to gather more information. I let him tell me what happened, going into more detail. Roy Hamilton, Rasur's partner, affirmed that he talked to Wagner and Walken and there was no indication that there was any argument. Despite the case's closure, as an accidental drowning, Rasur remains uncertain about the exact circumstances of Wood's death. I can't tell you exactly how she got into the water, he says today. Reflecting on his time in Wagner's Beverly Hills home, after the tragedy, witness Dennis Davern describes feeling like a virtual prisoner, unable to leave the house freely. Despite initial feelings of a camaraderie with Wagner, Davern eventually felt trapped and turned to alcohol. When I look back on it, Davern now says, I was a pure idiot. I had turned into a real drunk. I felt that I was a part of RJ, that he was going to make sure that Dennis was okay. According to CBS News, while the details of Wood's final hours remain unclear, even after 20 years and 450 pages of Natasha, author Suzanne Finstad sheds new light on the actress's life, which has long been shrouded in time myth, and Hollywood glamour. Wood was one of three sisters raised by Russian immigrant parents. Her mother, Maria Gordon, driven by a fortune teller's prediction that Natasha would become a renowned beauty, zealously pushed her into the film industry. Contrary to Hollywood lore that Wood was discovered by chance age at four, Natasha reveals Gurdon's relentless efforts to propel her daughter into stardom. The book recounts incidents like the butterfly episode and another during the filming of The Green Promise where a staged bridge collapse led to Wood breaking her left wrist and falling into the water below in terror. Gurdon concealed the accident and Wood's untreated broken wrist left her with a deformity she hid with a bracelet for the rest of her life, according to the book. The fortune teller's warning, beware of dark water, would induce fear that would haunt mother and daughter for the rest of their lives. In the aftermath of Natalie Wood's tragic death, Paul Ziffrin, her lawyer and friend, lamented the public's morbid fascination with the circumstances. To him, the only pertinent fact was her absence. The rest he dismissed as macrobo speculation. The circumstances of her death, while deemed accidental by the coroner, sparked speculation and theories. Some suggest she intended to drift in the dinghy seeking solace in the night air, while others proposed she slipped while attempting to secure the dinghy against the boat's motion. Natalie's fear of dark water adds a poignant layer to her story as her life ended tragically at sea, 
a place that held both allure and menace for her. Her passing left a void in Hollywood, a reminder of the fragility of life beneath the glittering surface of stardom. A few days after the tragedy, John Payne and his girlfriend Marilyn Wayne, a Los Angeles commodities broker, contacted the police. They said they were asleep aboard a boat named Capricorn, which was moored near Splendor that night. Around midnight, Payne heard a woman yelling, help me, someone please help me. The voice was coming from near the stern of Splendor, and Payne believed from someone in a dinghy. He awakened Wayne, who heard the cries too. The couple claimed they hadn't responded because a loud, drunken party was raging on a yacht nearby, and they thought someone was just playing around. They stated they heard a man's very drunken voice respond mockingly, Okay, honey, we'll get you. They believed the voice belonged to someone at the party, which reinforced their notion that the whole thing was a joke. The public face in the ensuing investigations was that of Thomas Noguchi, chief medical examiner in the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. The autopsy revealed that Wood died of drowning and that her body had superficial skin bruises on the arms and lower legs and a vertical abrasion on the left cheek, such as might have been caused by falling into the water. The toxicology report showed that her blood alcohol level was at least 0.14%, 0.04% above the level used in California to determine intoxication in automobile drivers. At a November 30th, 1981 press conference to announce the autopsy results, Noguchi tried gingerly downplaying Wood's apparent inebriation at the time of her death and any other sensational aspects of the case. The coroner was already under fire for his handling of the death of actor William Holden, who two weeks earlier had emptied a bottle of vodka in his Santa Monica apartment and then tripped gashing his forehead on a bedside table. He had bled to death, according to Noguchi, probably because he was too drunk to stanch the wound or call for help. By a strange coincidence, Holden's longtime companion was Stephanie Powers, Robert Wagner's then co-star in the hit television series, Heart, to heart. The romantic chemistry on the show had generated speculation about a real-life romance between the two TV stars. The Hollywood community was outraged that Noguchi had revealed Holden's drunkenness to the press, feeling it was an invasion of the deceased actor's privacy. From the physical evidence in the Wood case, Noguchi concluded that the actress had fallen into the water while trying to board the dinghy. Fingernail scratches on the valiant side showed she tried to hoist herself up from the water. But since her down jacket would quickly become waterlogged, she was probably impeded by the extra weight. Evidently, she never thought to remove the jacket, perhaps because her judgment was clouded by alcohol. She clung to the dinghy side as it drifted away from the splendor and the other boats in the harbor until finally overcome by exhaustion and hypothermia, she drowned.
before his press conference, Noguchi outlined this theory to his staff, only to have one of his colleagues point out what the reporters out there are really interested in, Dr. Noguchi, isn't so much whether Natalie Wood was intoxicated or not, but why she left the yacht in the middle of the night. Realizing the truth of that statement, Noguchi later wrote, he commissioned a psychological autopsy to find out why Wood felt she should separate herself from her husband and walk in that night. However, when the report on the real facts of the death of Natalie Wood came in, Noguchi decided not to release the document to the press. It added details the media would only call gory and sensational. The report did not alter the official coroner's conclusion of the accidental drowning, so rather than create more media indignation over too many details, he reluctantly filed away that report. Noguchi's discretion failed to save his job. Complaints from Frank Sinatra and the Screen Actors Guild, among others, continued to accuse him of sensationalizing his duties. He was demoted April 27, 1982. In his 1983 book, Coroner, about his most celebrated cases, Noguchi returned to the mysterious death of Natalie Wood. Indeed, he began the book with it. After acknowledging the crucial questions, wasn't it strange that the two men on the yacht didn't even know she left the boat? Hadn't she spoken with them? Why had she slipped out to the stern of the yacht in the middle of the night, climbed down a ladder and untied the dinghy. What was she doing? And where was she going? And why? And also, when she first fell off the swimming step into the water, why didn't she simply swim a few strokes and reboard the yacht by way of the step? It must have only been a few feet away from her. Even with the heavy jacket, she could have accomplished this effortlessly. He proceeded not to answer any of them. Instead, he spun a dramatic yarn about Woods clinging to the dinghy as she attempted to propel it to the beach by kicking her feet. The sea would play a dangerous and fateful role throughout Natalie Wood life. While filming Splendor in the Grass, the actress's fear of water came to Kanzen's attention. A few days before shooting the reservoir scene, Wood confided in the director that she had a deep-seated terror of water, particularly dark water, and of being helpless in it. Kanzen remembered thinking how perfect that was for the scene. Wood asked him if it could be shot in a small studio tank, but the director refused. He explained that the reservoir was shallow and her feet would always touch the bottom. She wasn't reassured, but she did the scene and did it well. But back on dry land, Kanzen remembered. Wood shivered with fear and then laughed hysterically with relief. It was not the first time that Wood's phobia had become an issue. When she was 11 in 1949, on the set of RKO's The Green Promise, she was supposed to cross a bridge that was rigged to collapse once she reached the other side. However, Somebody pulled the lever when she was halfway across and she fell 
into the water below. I don't even remember them fishing me out, Wood later recalled. An even more harrowing incident occurred while filming The Star with Bette Davis in 1952. Ironically, it happened off Catalina on a freezing January morning. The director, Stuart Heisler, wanted Wood to leap over the railing of Sterling Hayden's private yacht. Just jump, Heisler told her. There will be men in rowboats to pick you up. When she hit the water, she panicked and began screaming. Davis threatened to quit if they made Wood do the scene again. When they reshot it with a double, the stand-in became entangled in the kelp and nearly drowned. After all that, Wood said later, they cut the scene from the movie entirely. Four years after making Splendor in the Grass, Wood had yet another heart-stopping moment at sea. While filming a scene with Robert Redford in Santa Monica Bay for Robert Mulligan's Inside Daisy Clover, a giant rogue wave suddenly reared up, separating a small boat containing Wood and Redford from the crew and technicians. Mulligan recalled that there was no way we could get Natalie and Bob off the boat and the lines to keep them in place were breaking right and left. Redford thought the whole thing was a lark, but Wood was terrified. To many observers, suspicions grew due to feeling Wagner's potential jealousy that while his career continued to decline, hers would flourish. Shadow Hunters, journey with me into the shadows of queries and speculation. What happened to her? What shadowy events unfolded in the wee hours, leading to a puzzling two-hour delay between the desperate ship to shore call and the tardy notification to the Coast Guard? What happened to Natalie? Why did the distress call from the Splendor offer only a cryptic plea? This is the Splendor needs help, shrouding the true nature of the dire situation. What happened to her? How did the enigmatic circumstances surrounding the abandoned Prince Valiant, with its ignition key off, gear shift in neutral, and oars locked, fit into the unfolding mystery. What happened? What Natalie clandestine was? occurrences transpired during the fateful dinner party, culminating in the consumption of alcohol, broken glass, and the possible eruption of a violent altercation. What unseen forces provoked Natalie Wood's chilling scream as she embarked on the dinghy, hinting at a hidden struggle or a deeper, more sinister plot. What happened to her? How could a facade of happiness veil an underlying argument? And why did the authorities fail to unravel this web of deception? What happened to Natalie? Why would Natalie a woman plagued by the fear of dark water and unable to swim, dared to venture onto the dinghy with socks into the murky depths of the night. What, what sinister motives drove Wagner to insinuate Natalie's ill feel attempt to untie the dinghy alone knowing the treacherous conditions of the algae slicked steps. What happened to Natalie? What dark secrets lie beneath Wagner's unsettling hope that Natalie was rendered unconscious before plunging into the water, hinting 
at a malevolent design. I mean, this was your wife, whom you loved and adored, right? Why did Wagner and Christopher Walken remain silent on the tumultuous argument over Natalie and Christopher's flirtations, concealing a deeper layer of intrigue? Do you think Christopher will ever tell what happened to her? What clandestine exchange occurred between Wagner and Natalie after she retired to bed, ultimately leading to her mysterious disappearance? What happened to Natalie? What ignited Wagner's fury, prompting him to shatter glass after accusing Christopher Walken of inappropriate conduct, revealing a darker side to the night's events. Why did Natalie bear bruises on her body, with the coroner attributing them to contact with the boat's unforgiving hull, raising suspicions of foul play? Amidst the fog of alcohol, why did Davern abstain from intervening during the heated argument, considering he was considered her bodyguard, leaving the safety of all aboard in jeopardy? How did the tempestuous argument abruptly dissolve into an eerie silence as dark as the waters casting a chilling shadow over Natalie's fate. What unspoken fears drove Natalie, terrified by dark water, to venture alone into the pitch black night, abandoning the safety of the boat? What happened to her? Was it by choice or force, Shadow Hunter? What happened to why did Wagner hesitate to illuminate the night with floodlights or start the engine in search of his missing wife? And what cryptic message was conveyed by his plea to think about it? What need be thought out, Wagner? We'd like to know. With the puzzle pieces scattered, why did the authorities ultimately settle on the label of accident, leaving the case of Natalie Wood a haunting enigma for the ages? With scratch marks on side the splendor, how could no one aboard not hear anything, see anything, know anything? Did she regain consciousness when she landed in the water? and attempt to reboard the boat? Were the stairs retracted so she could not? Perhaps they all were involved. What say you, Shadow Hunters? What questions do you have in this twisted tale? Four entered the splendor, three of which dazzling stars in Hollywood's limelight. Three exited breathing contradictions of that fateful night, and one exited by way of the ocean's relentless embrace. In the labyrinthine maze of speculation and hearsay, where every clue leads to a new mystery, we are left to ponder. Did Natalie Wood's final act play out as a tragedy scripted by fate? Or was it a carefully orchestrated plot designed to conceal a more sinister narrative? Was her death truly an accident? Or did it conceal a darker truth hidden beneath the veneer of fame and fortune? As the curtain falls on the stage of her life, casting a long shadow over the legacy she left behind, one thing is certain, the mystery of Natalie Wood's death will continue to captivate and intrigue.
beckoning us to seek the truth that lies buried beneath the surface of her glittering facade. So, Shadow Hunters, as we exit the labyrinthine corridors of intrigue and deception in the Noir Syndicate, let us raise a glass to the fallen and toast to the enigma that is Inky Noir Champagne Mysteries, where the truth is the elusive prize and justice the final destination. Good night.